Okay, good morning and good afternoon to all our colleagues online. Welcome to the uh, Japanese encephalitis virus webinar this afternoon called One Health Perspective. Uh, we just wanted to um, welcome you. Please note, uh, if you have any questions uh, during today's session, please use the Q&A box anytime. And if you are on Twitter, please do join the conversation with us. Um, use the hashtag JEV and make sure that you tag Sydney ID in that conversation as well. Um, I'd like to start off by introducing um, our uh, the co-director for the Sydney Institute for Infectious Diseases, Professor Tanya Sorrell, and I'll pass on to Professor Sorrell now to open the event. Thank you very much, and over to you, please, Tanya. Thank you, Jocelyn, and it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this afternoon's event. It's the second in a two-part series of webinars on Japanese encephalitis virus. And I welcome you on behalf of the University of Sydney Institute for Infectious Diseases in partnership with the Australasian Society of Infectious Diseases Zoonoses Special Interest Group and the Australian Veterinary Association Veterinary Public Health Special Interest Group. I'd particularly like to acknowledge the leaders of Sydney ID's One Health Research Node, namely Professors Ruth Zadox, uh, Mike Walsh and Kate Bosworth, who at very short notice have put together this important uh, event for us. As is traditional for Australians and, and to explain to our international guests, uh, we acknowledge the traditional custodianship of the various lands on which we meet today and pay our respects to those who have cared and to continue to care for country. In light of the discussion today, a very important component of Japanese uh, encephalitis virus infection is of course its animal human relationship but also the ecological aspects of it. And we're going to focus on those today. It was only on the 4th of March this year that the acting uh, CMO or Chief Medical Officer of the Commonwealth, Dr. Sonia Bennett, declared that JEV was a communicable disease incident of national concern in Australia. We're seeing it in parts of the country that we've never seen it before. And we have a lot to learn from international experts who have much more experience with the disease. And in that context, I would like to now hand over to uh, Dr. Mike Walsh, who is going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much, Professor Sorrell. <clears throat> I would like to now uh, introduce our first speaker. It is my very great honor to welcome Dr. Mudassar Chanda for our first talk today. Dr. Chanda is a senior scientist with the National Institute of Veterinary Epidemiology and Disease Informatics, which is a part of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. Uh, Dr. Chanda is a veterinary microbiologist and a veterinary epidemiologist, and he has extensive exper expertise in vector-borne pathogens of livestock, as well as zoonoses of public health priority. He is an expert in geospatial analytics and infectious disease epidemiology, and has extensive experience in developing and coordinating livestock surveillance for mosquito-borne pathogens. Dr. Chanda is going to discuss today the epidemiology of Japanese encephalitis virus in India, particularly as it relates to the human-animal interface. Dr. Chanda, a very warm welcome to you, and thank you so much for being with us today in this webinar. You can share your screen now. Visible? Yes, we can see you. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Michael Walsh, for the uh, nice introduction and also you know, inviting for me for this important uh, webinar on Japanese and scalpitis. And uh, good morning to everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you're joined from different parts of the world. So the topic is uh, to, to look into the uh, no, Japanese encephalitis are the nexus of humans, animals, and the environment in India. So whatever we have brief work done on the you know, ecological aspects of that, I'll be discussing in this particular webinar. The outline of the uh, 
uh, today's uh, talk will be I'll just being the first speaker I thought like I'll be you know introducing to the par participants about the different transmission and you know background about the disease and uh, the role of different host uh, in that particular you know what are the different livestock species involved in that and what are the environmental factors responsible for the JE occurrence with, uh, particularly in India and what is the current scenario of JE in India with respect to seasonality and the spatial patterns what we have done uh, the uh, analyze the data and we can briefly discuss the preliminary results what we got with the spatial analysis so with this i'll just i think this uh, in terms of the, everybody knows about the you know, virus belongs to this family february day and uh, no, more than uh, 24 uh, countries are you know, endemic to je and every year it causes more than you know, 60000 cases mostly in the eastern and southeastern parts of asia and it has a very high case fatality rate of 25 to 30% and up to it can go up to 50 percent also. So this is uh, like you know a very um, brief uh, transmission cycle and um, if you see that uh, the waterfowl birds with where the uh, the disease is maintained you know we have this mosquito which can bite these and the maintenance of this virus is particular in this Hebron and degrade takes place and one important uh, you know, means of maintenance of this particular virus in this mosquito species is the transport and transmission and uh, the pigs are main you know the amplifying host for this particular disease and humans and in addition horses are considered as you know dead end host in this particular disease. So in terms of the uh, vectors involved in the transmission of this virus, uh, mostly the Culex Vishnui group and uh, Culex trite in New York is, uh, is the main vector which is responsible for the transmission of the disease. And which, which particularly you know, prefers to breed in you know, rice paddy fields and you know, active, all these features are there. And uh, in India, JV uh, is, uh, has been isolated from different species of mosquitoes, more than 17 species belonging to genera from Anopheles, Culex and Manchonia. So now like in the important, uh, what are the different role of different hosts and the environmental factors, which are important here, like people are aware of that. I'll just try to highlight very few important features of this particular disease, how the climate it's with all respect to the vector power. And the Cutus tritonia because species of mosquito can be found in the areas where the annual mean temperature is just from around 8 to 28 degrees Celsius. And the elevation they have found to around 838. And, other different studies which have done other climatic factors uh, play a very important role. And uh, irrigated agriculture, like the rice paddy fields, are the preferred habitat for breeding of mosquitoes and it can also attract the migratory birds. So in India, particularly in South India, what we have seen is you know there are two seasonal peaks of uh, Japanese and encephalitis uh, because of the, and it, that also coincides with the you know the rice paddy cultivation, which you know, happens every two years in some parts of South India. So these are some of the you know, important points with respect to different animals, what kind of role they can play in the, you know, not only amplifying host as a maintenance host or as a supplicant infection. Like in that pigs, uh, uh, we know like it's an amplifying host for the virus and it's still resulting in high viremia. And other important species uh, sometimes um, have been uh, uh, maybe overlooked is horses, which are you know, main host also affected with the disease, and they also act as a dead end host. And along with donkeys, they are also susceptible to the virus. JU virus is maintained in the birds uh, in the, the RB day. The other species, like, you know, because this is very important when you talk of this particular disease and the mosquito preference to these particular species, like, you know, cattle, sheep, goats, dogs, cats, all these species, you know, including chickens and ducks and some even wild mammals and reptiles and amphibians support subclinical infection. This is very important and they may not support very high viremia. And uh, there is a low virus titers in that because of that, um, you know, the horses and humans, they uh, sort of do not play a major role in maintenance of the infection in endemic areas. And uh, there are like always uh, you know, mosquito abundance and the uh, JEV uh, seropositivity in pigs has been correlated with human cases with different studies. And there is you know, there are many reports with subclinical infection and seropositivity in goats, dogs, and cats as well um, by different uh, studies. 
So there's some something like, you know, because uh, uh, just for the audience who are not aware of the disease in animals, you know, just to see that what kind of roles these animals play. Horses exhibit you no know, encephalitis symptoms with fever. And disease in swine is generally asymptomatic, whether it reports of pyrexia and anorexia and pigs. It can also cause abortion, stillborn, or weak or mummified fetuses. And there are many other uh, you know, clinical signs in the uh, male uh, pigs as well. Boars uh, will be uh, not discussing in the details of the clinical signs, but just major main clinical signs. And the mortality in horses, it can be up to 5%, it can go up to 30%, and in 100% in non immune piglets, and, and very low or maybe nil in adult swine. And the morbidity rate is around 1 to 4, 1 to 1.4 percent, and case fatality of 5 to 15 percent. That, that can reach 30 to 40 percent in severe outbreaks of horses. And there's all the you know the uh, epidemiological parameters only in animals I'm talking about, not in humans. So, and there are many studies in India they have carried out in terms of the seroprevalence of J in animals, and they have so you know, detected the antibodies in cattle, buffalo, sheep, goats, and dogs and birds as well. So. So this one aspect, I'm not going to the detail of uh, the overwintering part here, but uh, you know the viremia um, and JURS. Uh, so you can present in vertebrate host for a few days, and uh, there is one reason that you know the possibility of overwintering in vertebrate host is very less. But there are reports of non-vector mediated transmission of JURS between pigs, and this is one aspect which is very important. And one of our colleagues who is also working on this aspect is looking into those line. How the pigs can be, you know, maintain a career post and also play an important role uh, in the transmission of J uh, in absence of the vector as well. So, and the overwintering in invertebrates, uh, we talk of that, you know, the uh, transoverial transmission is one thing which has been reported. So that one reason it can you know, overwintering, uh, overwintering can happen in the uh, mosquito species. And moving on, like just a brief you know, uh, overview of the uh, disease transmission and the different host involved. And I like, like maybe uh, you know, throw some light on what is the current scenario of J in India with respect to the you know, seasonality, what is the spatial patterns and you know, spatial temporal patterns in India. Uh, and then we can uh, go on this brief analysis what we have done. So in terms of the historical thing, like if we see that you know, um, J was first uh, you know, um, um, reported from uh, encephalitis patients of North Narco District in Tamil Nadu in 1955 is the first serological evidence of J in India. And further, subsequently, it was isolated from mosquitoes and uh, from the brain samples in 1958. The first large, the large outbreak happened in West Bengal in two districts. So the uh, current, uh, in terms of this is one thing, you see that uh, this graph shows about the, uh, how the uh, number of districts and number of states being added every year to, to the J uh, no, uh, cases. If you see this graph, which says a number of uh, in the um, districts and also the states which have been affected. If you say this gradual increase in the number of uh, districts as well as states, we started with 14 states. If you compare the are not complete uh, since the first report, but uh, so in 2010 onwards, if you compare that, uh, initially there were 14 states, and now it's like 24 states. And in terms of the districts, if you say there were 19 districts, now we have 300 plus districts which have reported J in India. So in terms of the seasonality, like this one, two reports, I would like to say, you know, discuss here about the monthly distribution of the J cases, which has been done in Assam. Like, you know, this finds uh, some three years of information. If you see that, uh, how these cases are you know, peaks in uh, months of June to September, and that also coincides with the you know, mosquito abundance and subsequent spillover to, you know, swine population and also humans. And this is very interesting, you know, seasonality pattern of this particular mosquito species and also the J cases in Assam. Uh, that there are very less studies been done on the, you know, other, um, you know, mosquito seasonality or the JE seasonality in different parts of India. These two studies, which shows about the seasonality of this particular disease in you know, different years. And if you see this, you know, cumulative cases uh, which have been reported in India, if you see that particular, this particular map of India, which shows, you know, different states are endemic for that. But in particular, if you see the South states uh, are more affected, particularly the Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. And the 
major, uh, you know, endemic state, we can call it as it's Uttar Pradesh, which has, I'll uh, maybe speak about that in the next few slides, how uh, it has more of, you know, horses. And also you have this, you know, rice paddy cultivation in that place. And also the big population is also there. So this all combination of the factors which may be playing an important role in the, you know, why Uttar Pradesh is also endemic and other uh, states which are endemic. So because uh, this is a cumulative data for in the past uh, um, maybe 20 years. If you talk of the spatio-temporal patterns in uh, uh, in the occurrence of GJE cases, you do find like every year there is some you know, variation in the occurrence. There is interannual variation in the GE cases. Uh, but, and if you see start from 1992 onwards, they, you know states been added, but more or less like the, the states which are endemic, they have reported the you know occurrence of the. And if you see that you know the there is also some you know interannual variation uh, which happening, you know, which have been. Uh, we need to look into the factors what is you know playing an important role here in terms of the, the climatic factors or you know maybe even uh, cli extreme climatic events like El Nino or other factors which may be playing an important role in terms of the interannual variation so we are looking into those aspects for this particular round you know um, space-time data and like uh, now and briefly i'll try to you know discuss about what uh, uh, preliminary analysis we have done with the you know, existing data on the vector and also existing data on the uh, you know, JE cases in India, so that we can discuss uh, what environmental factors are important, how they are playing in you know uh, role in transmission of the disease, and so this one uh, thing uh, just uh, the uh, uh, zero positivity studies which have been done in, uh, in India because there are many studies. Uh, which has been conducted state level, also zonal level. If you see this first graph, first map, if you see the zero positivity of JE in horses, like, you know, there's one interesting finding is, you know, the Western zone. You know, if you see this particular graph of uh, the zero positivity in different zones of India, you find Western zone as, uh, you know, more uh, um, zero positivity in horses. But if you compare the human uh, JE cases, you find in uh, other states. So there's somewhere like, you know, maybe the uh, role of uh, horses, which is, you know, uh, maybe uh, sort of because it's also a dead end host, uh, so the you know densities of horses might be playing uh, a negative effect in that sense. So maybe not having more of J cases, or it may be a case of you know, maybe of underreporting also. So that's one thing, and this needs to be looked into uh, in the future analysis. And if you talk of what we did with the you know cumulus uh, triteni orcus um, uh, limited um, occurrence data, we try to. Uh, build up a habitat model using the different uh, modis variables and also include the, the different livestock densities in that and try to see that you know, maybe we, the data still is you know, existing in the gray literature or different places people have, might have done some surveys it needs to be you know uh, uh, looked into but whatever the limited data set which was available in the public domain we try to develop a you know, habitat model using you know, boosted regression models and we found that this is what we got the uh, the habitat mark for uh, uh, this particular vector and again if you see that uh, we included many uh, different environmental variables especially the modis uh, variables and also we included the livestock densities as you know predictive variables in this particular habitat model and you see that cases are you know <laughs> more in the southern part and the some parts of uh, uh, west completely west bengal is uh, showing you know have more uh, probability of presence of this particular vector and also the northeastern states of india and if you compare the J uh, with this uh, habitat map with the uh, occurrence of the J cases, so you do find there is you know because the data was uh, not much for the Uttar Pradesh states, especially the vector data. So we don't find some you know the habitat suitability for this particular vector in the Uttar Pradesh states. Apart from that, if you see the habitat map, we do find you know the locations which are you know in correspondence with the habitat map for this particular vector in India. So and. Uh, I'll just briefly discuss uh, what variables were important, uh, which we identified in this particular uh, know, habitat map. So I'll just briefly discuss that. So one was, you know, we have this minimum nighttime land surface temperature, which was, uh, you know, was identified as one of the important predictor variable in the habitat map of you know, the vector. So if you see that, you know, there is sort of slightly non-linear relationship here, and but we do find this class cases do increase in the cases, uh, do increase in the uh, places where there is you no know, slightly increase in the minimum temperature it goes. And and if you see these partial plots, what we call is you know, in combination of the uh, risk of the uh, or the you know habitat suitability of vector, and if you combine then if you see that areas 
you know the particularly the southern regions and also the part of uttar pradesh and also the other northeastern states are at you no know, risk of this uh, disease um, because of this vector presence and if you compare with the habitat map you know these all these three graphs shows you these and you know, the importance of this uh, you know like you know, night time land surface temperature in this vector distribution map and if you, the other variable which we found was you know uh, the minimum ndvi and if, again if you see this sort of non linear relationship here that's very important to identify these areas where this kind of you know uh, patterns are available so that we can target our um, surveillance in the domestic livestock species or the vector surveillance can be um, you know enhanced in these areas and if you see this partial plot also shows you know a sort of areas which are you know um, at, uh, which suit the uh, which is more of a uh, habitat for this particular vector and one one more uh, variable which i would like to discuss here was uh, so that uh, we also got uh, duck as one of the important predictor variable in our model uh, so but the there is less evidence in terms of domestic uh, birds which can play a role here either chickens or duck so this is one important thing to remember which maybe you know maybe dr michael was always talks about this bridge host kind of thing so we need to look into we know about the avian influenza part like how this species can play an important role as a bridge vector so we did identify uh, which was slight of um, a surprising result for us we you know we didn't get the pig's density as one important predictor variable but we got the duck you know as one of the you know, important predictor variable here there are reports one study which it was done in india was which we they found you know antibodies in ducks as well so this sort of you know results are interesting to see that and for the studies are required in that you know we can also analyze the uh, j occurrence uh, cases data to see what is happening but this is a vector no habitat model so and uh, in terms of the spatial analysis what we did we try to uh, not many variables just try to see based on our you know a priori hypothesis about what factors have been reported in literature about you know they could talk about the average rainfall or the peak population or the swine population sorry the host population and we also try to see that you know what is the uh, rice um, paddy cultivation and if you see that you know the pig and horse population is highest in uttar pradesh and also if you see the map of uh, the cases in uh, of je in humans you do find the maximum cases are also there in uttar pradesh state and the um, one thing is you know in terms of again the uh, uh, the rice production is also very much high in the state of uttar pradesh so these uh, variables we try to include in a very you know spatial model for uh, using the state level case data to try to identify to what roles and we also you know fit as you know uh, spatial model uh, and try to identify this is preliminary model not like the previous analysis but this is uh, the findings we got in the preliminary uh, spatial analysis if you see that you know, the picks are significant here in terms of the state level analysis we find that is positively associated with the occurrence of jeke cases right you know a known phenomenon but still we found in the uh, you know the spatial analysis we found that is significant we find the horses as uh, negatively negatively associated with the occurrence of jeke but uh, it's not significant only the variable which was significant in the spatial model was x and if you see the relative risk of the you know spatial heterogeneity part of uh, the analysis we find only two states which are sort of you know I can be said as a hotspot for J in India, like you know, which we have you know the relative risk of maybe around point nine to one. So, and I think this is a very preliminary analysis. We need to include more variables and try to fit the models and see what it comes up. So, with this, I'll try to summarize. You know, what we have done so far in this current status in India, and we need more studies on birds, especially in India, and the um, role of other domestic animals needs to be looked into. and one important aspect we have been discussing with the department human health department also there is vector surveillance going on but we need to plan the vector surveillance based on the you know habitat map for uh, the vector so that we can you know, prevent these spillovers not only in uh, amplifying host pigs but also human uh, spillover can be prevented that and ultimately the integrated one health approach what we are talking about so with this i like to you know uh, you know conclude my talk by thanking the director and other collaborators and which we have we been working together on so entomologists and people who have been working on the lab part developing the diagnostics at our institute and all our you know um, who have been working in this aspect thank you all and uh, thank you all for your attention i'll be happy to take any questions uh, thank you so much thank you so much dr chanda that was a fascinating uh, presentation lots and lots of information there 
really, really good information for us here in Australia to think about um, in terms of the spatial dimensions. We have a couple of uh, questions from the audience. I, if, uh, if I can pass those to you. So the first one is, do you find any correlation between the prevalence of human infection in India and geographic areas where pigs are more commonly kept species of farm animal. I think that's pretty much what you presented as your main finding. Yeah, yeah. One yeah, thing I can so add there is, yeah, and just add is like the scale of analysis with the state level, you know, maybe still if you go the district and also maybe much more finer resolution, we'll still find that association, I think, because of, you know, we did find that very high correlation in that it was the only variable which was significant in that spatial mm. analysis of state level. Mm. Uh, another question, do you think that the, increase in the number of districts that have been affected, uh, the, the increasing endemicity in the number of districts uh, is uh, possibly due to better detection now than uh, in past years, or do you think there is a genuine uh, expansion? Uh, there, there's something in the epidemiology has changed. Yeah, it's a very good question. And because this always been asked for any disease, for that matter, in terms of increased you know, surveillance uh, mechanism or you know, increased rate of detection because of the you know, improved diagnostics or you know, increase in many factors. But to answer the other part, you know, we'll not know unless we try to analyze the, the district at the district, uh, data at the district level. So we didn't do that. And definitely we may find some sort of, you know, maybe some sort of changes in terms of agriculture intensification is one factor, like maybe rice cultivation. You know, maybe the vector part also, you know, how this kind of uh, was spreading across uh, the district. So movement of animals is one factor, you know, pig density, maybe people have started you know, doing more of you know, uh, swine, uh, this uh, pig husbandry practices. So there are many factors I would not be able to pinpoint unless we do analyze that data. So there may be some factors, and but in addition to the increase, you know, rate of detection as well. I think that's it. Would be the answer. Yes, yes, of course. Um, the, another question, two, two different questions that I think can be combined into one is, um, is the first part, is there uh, sentinel surveillance done with any animals in India with pigs or horses or any? And also, uh, is there routine surveillance done on uh, mosquitoes for JEB? One thing we are discussing, at least with the state of Karnataka department, our colleagues, Dr. Shetan and Dr. Jagdish are in touch with them to start the, you know, uh, sentinel surveillance in pigs. So right now it's not been done. Uh, and uh, only things are done in terms of the seroprevalence studies, what we have so, seen so far in different studies. And we also take, took up some time back. So apart from that, there are no, no sort of proper sentinel surveillance you know, done in pigs. So, uh, what was the other part? I think that's it, right? So uh, and is there a routine surveillance in mosquitoes? Mosquitoes, yeah. The, there is a routine surveillance going on for the mosquito. But as I said, uh, we have been discussing this part with not only this vector, but many vectors for KFD or other vector bound disease or any disease for that matter to use sort of you know, habitat um, maps to target surveillance, right? So surveillance currently start you know, based on the endemic districts. The surveillance has been done in mosquitoes. Mosquitoes and the samples are tested you know, for JE virus presence here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we do have some more questions, but I think we'll have to leave it there because we have to uh, hand over to Ruth. But I would like to just say again, thank you so much, Dr. Thank Chanda. You. It was thank really you. a thank fascinating you. Uh, discussion you. and uh, so much to learn from the experience uh, in India. <clears throat> thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And from there, I would like to uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Ruth Zedox, who is going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Walsh and um, Dr. Chanda. That was a fantastic opening of our um, webinar. And some of these topics will uh, undoubtedly be revisited in the subsequent presentations. It's my great honor and pleasure now to introduce Professor Ken, and I'll leave it at his first name at his request, and also so that I don't mispronounce your surname, but maybe <laughs> you can tell us how to pronounce it in a moment. Professor Ken is director of the Department of Veterinary Science at the National Institute of Infectious Diseases in Japan, and holds an impressive number of positions as professor or emeritus, and has also won numerous awards for his work as veterinary microbiologist. That, that work has been disseminated through at least 250 peer-reviewed publications, 
which cover a wide array of host species and pathogen species, but with a specific interest in virology and equine medicine. And of course, JEV sits at the intersection of those two interests. Um, I'm very honored and, and very grateful, uh, Professor Ken, that you're willing to take us back to JEV's roots in Japan and to share your experience of JEV research and management across host species and to learn from um, your insights as to what we can or should do in Australia. I would also like to thank Dr. Matt Playfort for facilitating your participation in today's webinar. And with that, Professor Ken, can I please hand over to you to start your presentation? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Zadak. So my name is Ken Maeda. I'm a director of the Department of Veterinary Science, National Institute of Infectious Diseases. So before my talk, so I would like to appreciate Professor Zadak and the organizer for this nice opportunity. Thank you. So today's my topic is back to its root, JV in, in people and animals in Japan. So first of all, I would like to say, uh, Japan is not the root. Uh, Japan is the first place to detect JV and isolate JV. So I think, I don't know where is the root, but Japan is not, maybe not the root. Anyway, I would like to start my presentation. So Dr. Chander already uh, introduced the JV. So I, I omit this, uh, this, uh, this right. So this is a human case in Japan. I'm sorry. sorry. So 1950s, over 5,000 uh, 5, J cases were reported. And then 1955, we applied mouse brain Nakayama J vaccine. And then J cases is gradually decreased. However, uh, Nakayama strain is not, uh, it did not induce strong immune response. So we changed the vaccine strain to Beijing. So new vaccine is started from 1989 and then human case were less than 10. However, in 2004, we had uh, one child uh, with severe acute disseminated encephalomyelitis after va vaccine inauguration. So Japanese government stopped the vaccine and vaccine company developed the cell uh, propagated vaccine. So the cell is bare cells. So, and then in 19, uh, 2008, vaccine started again. Now, it, I, we think in Japan, uh, JB is under control. So this is a J case by month. So very similar to India. So uh, August to October is the most, uh, frequent season. And we say late, or late summer to autumn is the JE active season. This is the JG case by age and sex. In Japan, high risk group is old people and young people. 10 to 60 years old people is not, uh, they do not uh, risk, uh, did not have risk to JB infection because they are immunized with vaccine. So, and this is a geographical distribution of J patients. So in Japan, Kyushu is the south, southern part of Japan. So Kyushu is the highest number of J patients. And Shikoku, Chugo, Kinki is uh, also a high number of J patients. However, northern part of Japan, Hokkaido and Tohoku, 
there is no cases. We, because J vector mosquito is uh, only located in uh, Western Asaza and Western part of Japan. That's why uh, in this region, uh, Western part of Japan is a high risk and the Northern, Northern part is a less risk of JB infection. So this is a cere prevalence of virus neutralization antibody against JB in Japanese. So in Japan, uh, standard schedule of J vaccination is twice in three years old and once in four years old and nine, uh, once in uh, nine years old. Total four vaccines were inoculated. So you can see easily uh, after three years old, many people has a virus neutralization antibody. And then we showed in 2004, uh, Margaret one is uh, uh, after 2004, uh, vaccine is stopped. Then uh, many people, uh, many children does not have a vaccine. That's why uh, young children does not have antibody in 2008. However, now vaccine program is uh, recovered and then uh, cell prevalence is uh, uh, as a normal. So that's why, so we can say uh, in Japan, vaccine can prevent JV infection. So this is a mosquito species and uh, J, JV isolation. So you can see easily, so in Japan, Curex tritaniorhynchus is a major captured mosquitoes and then Aedes and Curex pipes. And 10% uh, of pools were positive JV. So one pool is around about 50 to 100 mosquitoes. So, and Curex pipes is also JV uh, inf infected with JB. How, however, uh, pulse number is uh, 200, about 200. So per, uh, positivity is uh, less than Curex tritaniorhynchus. So in Japan, Curex tritaniorhynchus is major vector species because uh, capture number is the highest and the uh, infectivity is also highest. So that's why uh, we can say uh, Curex tritaniorhynchus is a major vector. However, we have to think uh, the other mosquito is also uh, can transmit JV uh, like India. So uh, this is a num uh, this shows the number of JV vector mosquito collected in cow shed in of Yamaguchi, Japan. So in winter time, uh, mosquito Curex tritaniorhynchus to ty take hibernation, uh, and in spring they wake up and then emerge from hibernation and they suck the animals. And then summer times, uh, they become uh, active again. And then JV spread uh, late summer and autumn. Uh, JV active uh, late summer in late summer and autumn. So this is our data. So this shows the cell prevalence of JB infection in Japanese macaque in Aichi Prefecture. Aichi Prefecture is the middle of Japan. So not so, main, so active, JB is not so active place. However, 50, about 50% 50 is 50% uh, uh, 50 
markup is positive for JB. And uh, this slide shows uh, uh, JV uh, monkey become JV positive age dependently. Zero to three uh, years old is uh, about 10%, four to seven years old is uh, about 40, and about seven years old, about, uh, about 70% become post for J. So this is also our data. So we try, we perform surveillance of JV infection in around Wutan in Borneo Island in Indonesia. So I surprised 85.7% 85 85 were positive for JV. So in Indonesia, so human and orangutan is also uh, infected with JV. So this is a clinical symptom in J horses. Uh, many horses is subclinical. However, uh, some horses shows a fetal arthritis, anorexia, lethargy, and fever. So under uh, these horse clinical symptom were also presented by that, uh, Dr. Chanda, so I will omit. But uh, in Japan, <clears throat> this is a number of J post J cases in Japan. In 1948, uh, over 3,500 cases were reported. And then this, in this year, mass brain propagated JV vaccine were ad, uh, applied to horses. And then rapidly, horse cases were decreased. And uh, in 1985, uh, barrel cell propagated Beijing strain were available. And then now we cannot find any uh, host cases. This one, uh, oh, this one is a non-vaccinated horses. So this horse is originate from Hokkaido. Hokkaido is no JE. So that's why the horse did not vaccinate, was not vaccinated. And then the horse moved to Hok from Hokkaido to Totori. Totori is a J active region. And then this horse shows a clinical sign and death. So in Japan, uh, horse were inoculated influenza equine influenza vaccine every half year, and J vaccine twice dose per year, a tetanus vaccine once dose per year. So for JE, uh, horse were inoculated twice per year. So this is a change of anti-JB anti antibody in riding horse. So before summertime, horse were inoculated vaccine twice. And then uh, antibody were rapidly increased and then gradually decreased. And this year only once, so uh, not illegal, but not good. Uh, but after uh, vaccination and antibody increase and uh, gradually decrease, and before su summer times, uh, vaccine inaugurate twice, uh, horse were inaugurated twice, and then antibody is increased. So that's why Japanese horse were protected from JV infection by vaccination. So this is a clinical symptom in pigs. Pigs, uh, in pigs, so reproductive disease is major. Abortion is so stillbirth, mummified fetus. Uh, important is a usually at time. And reduce the number of, and the mortality of sperm in birth. And then uh, in Japan, pigs, is a very important animals as essential for JV infection. 
So to assess the risk of JV infection in human, pigs were used as central in Japan. Pigs, uh, because pigs is very sensitive to J, and almost pigs are less than six months old. So many pigs did not experience the last summer. That's why the all, almost pigs ha, did not infected with JB. And then we use the pigs as a sentinel. So under pigs shows a baremi. So we will use the pig for isolation and detection of JB. And the vaccine for pigs in Japan, so and boar is a target. For so, so first pre, only first pregnancy so is a target. Second pregnancy is uh, that means they experience summertime at least once. So experience summertime mean in Japan, JV infected. So second time, second pregnancy uh, is a uh, pregnant so is uh, not important, uh, not, uh, should not be vaccinated because uh, they have antibody by natural infection. So this is the result of cell uh, surveillance like so prevalence ratio among central peaks in Japan. In Japan, uh, in July, August, October, we will examine the cell prevalence. And then uh, pigs were gradually uh, infected. And in October, many pigs were pushed for JB. Uh, so, but Recently, uh, J, uh, JV positive pigs were less than previous time. I don't know the reason. And there are some disease, uh, some pigs become disease. So in Japan, about 10 pigs, uh, 10 J pigs were reported every year. And wild boar is in Japan. Wild boar is there are many wild boar in Japan. So we check the uh, wild boar cells. So about fifty percent wild boar were positive in Japan. And every year, uh, JV were active in wild boars. So this is also my. Uh, uh, this is a. Uh, this ratio shows the diseased livestock animals by JB infection. So very rare. However, some cattle and a few goat were reported for for JB uh, reported as JB infection, and then they show the enteritis and the virus were isolated of, from the diseased animals. So we think a human and a horse were very sensitive to JV, but some other animals is uh, very rare. How, however, shows a clinical symptom. And this is our data. We, we perform the cell survey in pet dog because uh, in big city, there is no pig farm in Japan. So pet dog is uh, live, in, live with owner. That's mean pet dog become positive. Uh, that mean uh, owner has a risk to JB infection. That's why we surveyed the JB infection in pet dog. So similar to pigs, uh, cute, half of dogs were infected with JB in Kyushu Island. And in northern part, in Hokkaido, 
uh, there are no positive pets, uh, dogs. Uh, very similar to pig, uh, pig and uh, human cases. So dog is also uh, dog is also useful as a sentinel for JB, especially in big city. So we surveyed wild animals. So many wild animals were positive for JB, and uh, we want to uh, show the thirty three percent of bats were positive. In Japan, bats became, uh, became were virulent, and uh, virus were isolated from bats. Uh, bat share. So, I think bat is one of the amplifier for JB. Uh, but uh, bat is not so many. So we think uh, the possibility is very there. But uh, we have to think. And uh, I inaugurate JB to do, uh, dog experimentally. So dog is very sensitive, but neutralization antibody increase rapidly after infection and keep high title of JB antibody. And uh, after inoculation, C-reactive protein in also increase. This means JB infected dog and inflammatory response were occurred in, within dog, inside the dog, but no clinical symptom. Uh, so dog is sensitive, sensitive to J, dog is also sensitive to JEB. So under uh, JV uh, is classified into five genotypes. And uh, genotype one is uh, spreading wide area of Asia. Genotype two are uh, spreading around Indonesia. Genotype three is a wider area of Japan. I see. And uh, genotype four uh, is uh, Indonesia and your country. So now many J researchers think uh, Japanese, Japanese as variety spread easily uh, across, the, across the country. So we hypothesize uh, maybe JB is, uh, we hypothesize similar uh, situation. So in Japan, because in Japan, genotype shift were occurred from genotype three to genotype one in 2000, around 2000, uh, 1990. So that's the Dr. Morita is a very famous J, J, Japanese encephalitis researcher. So this is uh, his uh, review. So his review shows a uh, uh, genotype one were enter from Asian country to Japan several times. So maybe a birds, birds or mosquito will transmit J to Japan, JB to Japan. So we surveyed uh, in ja Asian country. We collect, uh, we succeeded uh, Japanese uh, isolate, with isolation of JB from four countries. So we made fusion three. So Japanese isolate were belongs to genotype 1A and Thailand isolated genotype 1B. Philippines isolate genotype 3. Indonesia isolate is genotype 4. We think genotype 1 is spreading many, many Asian, Asian country. However, all country is different type were spreading. I surprised. So this is a uh, uh, in detail analysis. So Japanese isolate is very close to China and the Korean strain. So same origin mean uh, maybe uh, from Asian 
Asian country to Japan, and General Type 1 entered. However, Thailand strain is a cluster with old Thailand strain. So all this one is 1985. So this means JV is maintained in Thailand. Philippines and Indonesia is also. Uh, Philippines isolate is clustered with uh, 1984 strain. Cluster with 1984 strain. And Indonesian strain is uh, 1981, uh, cluster with 1981 strains. So this means in Japan, a uh, genotype shift occurred, maybe mosquito and bird transmitted virus. However, uh, in each endemic region, JV is maintained, uh, each uh, indigenously maintained. So this is a message from Japan to Australia. Japan, uh, I, from me to, Australia. A human and host are sensitive for JE and sometimes show severe clinical symptoms and secret life. So JV is a vaccine preventable disease. So if you have you have a risk to JV infection, uh, we would recommend JV vaccine. So, and the JV is transmitted by mosquito. Extermination of mosquito is also effective to reduce the risk. So insect, insecticide is also available for protect mosquito. And uh, I would like to say to assess the risk, pig is a good center. Sometimes dog is also good center in big city because big city, in big city, there is no pig farms. That's all. So this study were conducted by many our collaborators and uh, some grants support our studies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Ken. That was fantastic. You're an absolute font of knowledge on JAV. And, uh, and I know that there's a lot more that you could tell, uh, for example, about the related Gita virus. Uh, so maybe we can invite you back for another seminar to, to talk about all the things that we didn't have time for. <laughs> exactly. There were quite a few questions and um, maybe some of those can be answered in writing. But I think a lot of the questions revolved around what's the response when JAV is detected in pigs or dogs? What happens when you do the sentinel surveillance and you detect JAV? What is the public health response or the animal health response to those findings? So the, you mean uh, why? Uh, how? Sorry, Matt, please. Ah, ano inuneko no ma pet no kainushi wa dou hanno shimasu ka no kansen ga shindan saretara. Ah, I'm sorry. So okay, so pet owner and. Uh, if uh, the pet will become positive in Japan, that is a uh, JB is a very friendly, friendly, but uh, uh, but that is a not special virus for in Japan. So many people vaccinated and uh, uh, many people know. So mosquito is a uh, dangerous. So uh, uh, we we have. Uh, uh, Japan, we have an uh, opportunity to uh, infect JB. That's why we vaccinated. So, owner knows the JB. So, if a uh, pet dog become positive, so they don't worry. And uh, I want to say, dog does not become viremia, not viremia. So, th that's very important. So, uh, that's why, so not uh, like pigs. So no clinical symptom and then no viremia. That's why dog is a good, <laughs> so sentinel in big city. So 
other place, so pig is the best. I think your country is also. And uh, wild boar is also very sensitive for JB. So I would like, I'm trying to survey, but uh, sometimes difficult, difficult to get. <laughs> so pig C is better. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. And Matt, I think you've just demonstrated some very impressive Kaurad arrived language skills. Um, there are a lot more questions in the Q&A chat. So if you can continue answering those in writing, that will be fantastic. Okay. Meanwhile, I'll hand over to Associate Professor Kate Bosworth, who will introduce our last speaker and also uh, an additional panelist. So thank you again, Prof Ken. And thank over you. to you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, and thanks again, Professor Ken. That was very interesting. Well, we're up to the third speaker, and I'm delighted to share moderating this part of the webinar with my veterinary colleague, Dr. Rebecca Gang, who is the president of the Australian Veterinarians and Public Health Significant Interest Group of the Australian Veterinary Association, who are co-hosting this One Health webinar. And I'm also wearing two hats today. Um, I'm the co-leader of the One Health node of the Sydney Infectious Diseases um, group, but I'm also one of the two incoming co-leaders of the Zoonoses Significant Interest Group of the Australian Society for Infectious Diseases, which is also co-hosting this webinar, along with the other incoming um, co-leader, my medical colleague, Catherine Wilkes. But with no further ado, I want to introduce our third speaker, uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Sarah Britton, who's the New South Wales Chief Veterinary Officer and Group Director for Animal Biosecurity. Sarah is the New South Wales Chief Veterinary Officer and leads New South Wales DPI's Animal Biosecurity Unit in the prevention and control of exotic and endemic animal pests and diseases. She represents New South Wales on the Animal Health Committee, leading the development of animal health policy and operations at a state and national level. She's chair of Wildlife Health Australia and a trustee for the Mugabe Smith Institute. Sarah has extensive veterinary experience in government, industry and private animal sectors, animal health sectors, and she's passionate about animal biosecurity and welfare, wildlife health conversation, conversation, conservation, one health, antimicrobial stewardship and building highly motivated teams. Sarah was awarded an Australian Rural Leadership Program Scholarship in 2018. Thanks for joining us today, Sarah, um, to speak on Japanese and Capillitis virus in non-human hosts and the response in New South Wales from the recent outbreak. Thank you, Kate. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to come and speak today. I really appreciate that uh, the, the Institute would be able to hold this. So probably fascinating talks prior to me, and I think um, really interesting experience that's been held elsewhere in the world. And I think we can learn a lot from it and um, certainly be interested in Professor Ken and Dr. Chanders' thoughts as they're watching us go through this process of uh, what they've done um, many times before. So what I'm gonna to do today is outline just the response that we've seen in New South Wales, and also just to give you some Australian um, background to it and just what's unfolded for us over the last few months. So just to give you a little bit of history of JEB in humans in Australia. So in 1995, there was an outbreak in the Torres Strait Islands, which um, caused three human cases, including two that were fatal. And there was evidence of infection also in the mosquitoes and the pigs on those affected islands. And then in 1980, 1998, there was another human case in the Torres Strait Islands and along with the Australian mainland um, up in the Cape York Peninsula. So the, really what happened was in, under surveillance activities, the virus just circulated sort of across the Torres Strait Islands, you know, up to PNG, northern tip of Cape York Peninsula and sort of cycling around that area, just depending on the conditions. And, um, you know, it's believed to have come down sort of through from Papua New Guinea where it was believed to be endemic. So what sort of changed then last year in March 21, there was a fatal human case in the Tiwi Islands, which is just off the coast of Northern Territory. And it was caused by um, genotype four, which we just heard about from Professor Ken. And, you know, only been sort of generally found in the Indonesian area. And then sort of moving on a year later, 
uh, on the 4th of March 22, there was the first human case of JE, which was confirmed in Queensland and then um, followed by cases in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, all of the genotype 4. And currently uh, there's 36 human cases nationally. Just a bit of the history of JEV in animals in Australia. So after the fatal case in, of the human in Northern Territory last year, Northern Territory undertook surveillance in animals in July 21, and they didn't find any evidence of JEV except for some um, samples taken from Sentinel cattle right up sort of the top of Northern Australia in November 20 and March and April 21, and they were both seropositive for JE. At the same time, um, Queensland had detected J and pig samples from Townsville in April last year, and this was only retrospectively done um, once there was the outbreak this year. And then we found from the 25th of February, four states pretty much simultaneously found detections of um, JV genotype 4 with South Australia, uh, with New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria um, getting cases around the 25th and the 26th of February. And also um, a few days later, it was detected in South Australia or diagnosed in South Australia. So it's also been detected in a one alpaca in South Australia. And recently, in recent times, Northern Territory has detected it in two feral pig samples. So the interesting part is that um, the question always is, how did it get here? Obviously, we know it's been circulating off the top of Cape York. It's in Indonesia, it's in Papua New Guinea. Um, lots of questions and work being done at, underway at the moment as to, well, how did it actually get here? Did it come down with the water birds? Because, you know, certainly for Southern Australia, we've had such abundant rain and the seasons have um, encouraged water birds to come further south and to breed. And it's been, a, you know, a great breeding season. Or, you know, has it been due to a cyclone or something like that that's picked up and dumped the mosquitoes further south? Um, and it could be for many other reasons. And I think this is part of the process that we're going through now with looking at retrospective sampling, looking at the isolates and sequencing, and then trying to pull it together as to what it looks like. And certainly we've got a lot of um, epidemiologists and laboratory people that are have putting together a very nice phylogenetic tree as we saw earlier in the slides from our other previous speakers to try to determine what's happened you know, how has it moved here? And that might just give us a bit of an idea if it's come down from Cape York, if it's come down from Northern Territory or if it's done both. Um, I'll skip through this one because uh, Dr. Chander had outlined really a great overview of how this, how the, it's actually maintained in the, their natural cycle. But I think probably the key feature I wanted to highlight here was there was, um, always going to be sort of three ways that we found out this, this disease was present. You know, it's either the, the pig showed the signs, the human shows the signs, or uh, it was picked up in the mosquito surveillance, or potentially we did pick it up in horses as we've seen it in, um, you know, other countries has been a, a major area of infection. So probably the thing that really actually led us to this diagnosis is the pigs and just the overwhelming number of um, domestic piggeries that started to show reproductive signs and, you know, simultaneously it, it, as we went through. So the situation with the pigs, so as I mentioned, the first diagnosis was simultaneously made, you know, Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria very closely following and then um, South Australia not long after. So it was uh, initially detected uh, always on a Friday afternoon as we generally get most of these outbreaks. And we were advised on about 6 p.m. on the Friday the 25th that in New South Wales, we had had it diagnosed in four piggeries. This sort of follows from a, a few weeks, there had been increasing number of reproductive signs and issues happening in piggeries across, especially across southern New South Wales. And there had been a number of investigations trying to rule out a, a whole range of diseases. And it wasn't until towards that end of that week, the diagnosis that um, the laboratory and the virologist said, what about JE? And uh, um, at our national laboratory, it was tested and yep, came back with JE. So that's what set the path forward. 
and then um, has also then resulted in a lot of retrospective testing and obviously in the human aspects to going and looking at a lot of encephalitis that perhaps was unknown origin. So where we are at the moment in the current situation is we've got um, 73 infected piggeries with 30 in New South Wales, 14 in Queensland, 22 in Victoria, seven in South Australia. And as I mentioned, we've got the, the two feral pigs in um, Northern Territory. And currently in New South Wales, we've got 12 human cases. So just what the clinical signs that we're seeing, um, over time, this has changed from, from what we got reported in the initial um, infected properties to what we're actually seeing now. And really, this is the result of when the sows have actually got infected during their gestation period and what does that actually um, result in. So certainly for some of our bigger piggeries, you know, initially um, they were just seeing some abortions, uh, you know, some tremors in the piglets that were born and um, it moved very depends where at the point that the sow was actually, you know, bitten by an infected mosquito as to what signs it would see. And what we're tending to see um, now is also still some extended gestations, you know, a lot of stillborns and, um, you know, some mummified fetus is still happening at this point in time. There were, uh, for, for one of the properties that was diagnosed for um, in New South Wales on the 25th of February, when uh, so work was done retrospectively, actually diagnosed that property, their first um, detection was actually on the 17th of January. So that's just a few more um, pictures and I'd like, just like to thank Bernie Gleeson for these photos of just some of the other abnormalities that they saw as it progressed. So unfortunately, you know, pretty unpleasant for a lot of the people working in the um, piggeries because of the dramatic changes and huge losses in the number of litters that, you know, going forward, which will have an impact. So just as I mentioned now, what's happening, we're tending to see less of the shaking pigs. Uh, majority of them are stillborn and mummies overturn litters. And the incident's still pretty high. As you can see, this is one of the properties in New South Wales and the impact of just what the affected versus the unaffected litters are. And we're sort of just hoping that that epidemiological curve in a sense ends up coming back down the other way pretty soon as we start coming into cooler weather and the mosquitoes being um, around less. So as I mentioned, incident on this particular property, you know, we're sitting at around 50 to 60% of affected litters each week. And um, doesn't mean all the litters are affected, you know, sometimes some of them are born live. In New South Wales, the, the situation we have is, is that we have got the vectors and, you know, it's transmitted by a number of different species of mosquitoes. And the primary vector of concern that um, gets monitored very closely by our, our health colleagues is uh, present in quite a lot of areas within Australia. And certainly from the mosquito surveillance that had been done, there was reports of very high, high and very high activity of annual rosterus during the um, November period in inland New South Wales. With just looking at some retrospective um, work that was done by New South Wales Health, when the outbreak occurred, there is a normal network of um, mosquito, mosquito surveillance, but they also put out a lot of extra traps around New South Wales, which were sort of enhanced to see if there was um, increased activity around New South Wales at that point. On those extra traps that were put around, we actually didn't pick up any positives, but within the routine network of surveillance, there was positives picked up around the 17th of January and the 24th of January around the Forbes area and 10th of January. chickens actually correlate very closely with what we found in the pigs. 
and they sort of also correlate with where we were seeing peak activity in the piggeries. So they didn't necessarily pick it up before all the events happened when the pigs might have got infected and before they showed clinical signs, but actually did relate to the, where we're seeing the majority of the clinical signs in those areas. So what's currently happening at the moment, um, obviously any case in horses or pigs or alpacas or other species that fit the clinical picture are being tested for uh, JE. And also we're um, undergoing surveillance and looking retrospectively to identify when did it actually arrive here and um, what, what is a good sentinel, I suppose. We've just heard from Dr. Ken, we were considering pigs seem to be the, the biggest and the um, best way to be able to determine this quickly from what we've ex already experienced. So what we've seen is, is that the earliest clinical signs in pigs um, has come in, in New South Wales around December 21. And we, if we go back according to the signs of what those pigs were showing, it suggests that um, infection was potentially getting, the pigs were getting infected around November. Again, Southern New South Wales infection time looks like it was around late November, early December. And we had evidence of seroconversion in pigs in early January in Southern New South Wales. So if a couple of our boars and our boar studs, there was evidence in the boars in late December, early January. And so they, they had very marked um, infertility and changes that were quite persistent once the, the boars got infected. And this does coincide with reports of very high mosquito numbers from around November and December in some of the affected piggeries and with the mosquito surveillance that we saw in, with New South Wales Health. So where we're situated at the moment is, is we certainly got evidence that probably mosquitoes were infected around the November, December period in New South Wales, and it does correlate with the clinical signs that we have seen in um, pigs and certainly with the incidence of what we've seen in humans going forward and that's continued to come be at high numbers through January, February, March. And, um, you know, we're sort of starting to hope that in the southern areas of New South Wales with the cooler temperatures that uh, mosquitoes will be dropping off. So just to give a quick outline of the JE response, um, as mentioned before, that, you know, it was declared a communicable disease incident of national significance on the 4th of March. And there was a request to have a national approach in relation to the coordination of the health policy interventions and public messaging. So basically it's been a national coordination and um, state implementation because the states have the legislation to be able to implement a response to, to this type of um, disease. The interesting part is, is that because it is truly a One Health response, how it's actually worked right up the animal health um, line and the, the human health line. And so both have put in place their normal emergency response approaches and plans. And certainly for um, the animal health side, we have an OSVET plan for Japanese encephalitis, which outlines or provides guidance and an approach. And then we also have the formal committees that put in, are put into action when we do have a animal disease response, which is the Cons Consultative Committee of Emergency Animal Diseases, which is most of the chief veterinary officers, and what is normally called the National Management Group, but for this was called the National Strategic Group for this One Health approach, which is a lot of the senior ag officials. And similarly, on the human health side, there was uh, a lot of interplay of their key groups and you know, the National Arbovirus, the monitoring, the mosquito groups, the Centre of Disease, um, National uh, Communicable Disease groups, they were the key players in helping um, provide advice in this particular outbreak and that formed a national joint One Health plan. It also led to the rapid establishment of national working groups and that involved um, mosquito working groups, um, also had a number of vector control groups and also in the animal health side, a movement of pigs groups and um, declared premises and just identifying the, the different groups that were available. 
So it's really been a collaborative approach between human and animal health and the pig and the horse industries. And I think it's critical to say you know, it needs all of those people to be involved and also really needs the environmental agencies as well from the uh, aspect of looking at where this is a reservoir. The key things from a JE response, as I said, it was a joint partnership. So not only was it at a national level, but at New South Wales, we have a joint one health plan with New South Wales Health and we have a joint surveillance plan. And that's key to identify the actions that we wanna do jointly now and what we actually wanna be doing going into next season um, and you know, monitoring it, if it, whether it's overwintering. As part of the process, we put in place a Japanese encephalitis control order. And really this was to help manage pig and semen movements from pigs and from infected premises and suspect premises and to be able to enable the industry to keep moving, but with uh, risk assessed movements and to be able to give confidence to our health colleagues that the, the pigs were um, moving and not causing any public health issues as a result of that. Part of that process is a record of movement. So we do know where all the pigs have gone and um, outlines the vector control that all those piggeries need to have in place to um, ensure that they manage and reduce the number of mosquitoes. So there's a plain English guide that helps provide that info. Um, one of the key parts is the vector control on, in, on the farm and in the community. And a large part of the actions working across with health is identifying where susceptible groups are for vaccination and rolling out the vaccination program um, for humans and especially for those people that work in close contact with the piggeries. There's also a national animal health surveillance plan, which um, we contribute to. And there is a New South Wales joint surveillance plan. And our focus has been on the mosquito trapping um, the sentinel chickens and, and the testing of the pig horses now packers and we're looking at um, trying to set up a sentinel pig program for next year for next season which of course just still requires a bit of um, you know policy decisions and ensuring that it doesn't have any adverse impacts for the industry if we were to do so. One of the key pieces of work that was done by one of the national worker groups was this fact sheet which can be found on the um, farm biosecurity site on Animal Health Australia's website. And this um, is really important document and it outlines how to manage mosquitoes on property. Um, the group looked at the different permits, what, what chemicals could be used, uh, what advice for people working on the properties of what they could do, managing to um, reduce the amount of water lying around and it targets all stages of the mosquito life cycle as it requires a you know, combination of non-chemical and chemical methods being most, um, the most effective way. And I think probably the key, it's a really key, this has been a, a great piece of work that involved the entomologist health. And um, as it said, a, a number of different people across the animal health and, and controlled substances groups that managed to put this together. And I would strongly encourage people to have a look on the farm biosecurity site and access these documents as they, they're very useful. And I think this group, has also looked at this for horses and also looking at it for um, abattoirs and will be also extending their skills across to lumpy skin disease in the future. So that's probably just a really quick overview of what's happened um, in New South Wales and certainly just to give you a bit of an overview of the Australian uh, impact as a result of this disease. And I think really the key question for us is, is now what happens over winter? What happens um, coming into the years ahead? And you know, what can we do in regards to vaccination of, of animals, horses and pigs, humans, um, continuing to roll that out to susceptible groups and you know, how we keep that one health joint process going forward because this is what, you know, a fine example of where we do need to be working together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, that was really interesting, really great overview of um, the Australian experience and, and um, New South Wales in particular. Um, there's a, a question about the um, whether you know whether the Townsville pig detections were um, in feral pigs or from piggeries. Yes, my understanding it's from a piggery and it was only a, a rep like done retrospectively, it wasn't actually picked up last year. 
Um, and a question from me, um, just about um, if you could give us a, a brief overview of um, surveillance of feral pigs or um, sort of what is planned um, in that area, if you can. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so look, feral pigs is a really interesting one because I suppose as you look at, we, we've been a bit of a sitting duck in many ways, haven't we? We've got the vector, we've got an abundance of feral pigs and, you know, we have a lot of domestic piggeries as well. So there is surveillance underway for feral pigs and it's certainly targeted. And up in Northern Australia, the focus being more on feral pigs. Um, Southern Australia, the focus being more on domestic piggeries because we have got that ability to be able to target and, um, uh, you know, as, as heard before, they're a great sentinel. We have, certainly for New South Wales, we've got quite a number of feral pig samples that we've had for, uh, we can have a look at retrospectively and really the purpose of testing those will be to inform us just maybe how it moved through the state and if we can pick it up, it, we picked it up where it moved through the state. But I think, you know, considering for us in the southern parts where we do have a lot of domestic piggeries, I think the domestic piggeries are going to be the more um, easier and more accurate way of being able to determine if the disease is present or not. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and I will hand back to Tanya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I think we've been treated to a wonderful hour of um, talks and discussion around a very important topic. One of the things to speculate on, which I guess you did raise at the end, is where to now with JE virus in Australia? And can we actually eradicate it from the southern parts of the country? I was encouraged by Professor Ken saying that it had been largely reduced or eliminated in Japan, but you do have an active vaccination program, I also note. Um, the issue of climate change is very much on people's minds, of course, and with the recent flooding events that we've had on the east coast of Australia, I think that's particularly concerning from my point of view. There was just one question, I think, that hasn't been addressed uh, that was asked by uh, Dr. Mark Shipp, which relates to the impact of vaccination against different genotypes, and in particular, whether vaccination against genotype 3 will protect against genotype 4. And I wonder if any of our guest speakers are able to answer that question for him. Uh, Professor Ken, are you able to answer the question? Yeah, so uh, we say genotypes, but uh, JV is one serotypes, not so big uh, antigenic difference. So uh, I did a cross reactivity test. So uh, all, many, uh, not a big difference between genotype, among genotypes. So you don't worry, genotype three works well for genotype four. Great, that's, yeah. that's exactly what we wanted to hear, I suspect, Professor Ken. Uh, we have only a minute left in our session today. So I would like to thank uh, from the bottom of my heart, all of the speakers and contributors today and those who uh, asked questions. Uh, if there are other issues that you think are important and that another one of these webinars would be of value, please let us know. Uh, email us, uh, email either through the University of Sydney Infectious Diseases or the Australasian Society for Infectious Diseases or the Australian Veterinary Association Veterinary Public Health Special Interest Group. The webinar will be made available um, after it's just been trimmed and edited slightly uh, through the Sydney Institute for Infectious Diseases website with links being provided to our other uh, partners uh, in crime today uh, that enabled us to really run such a successful webinar. So thank you all very much once more. And finally, uh, behind the scenes, I'd particularly like to thank Sydney IDs, uh, Dr. Jocelyn Basile and Christine Aitken for all the support they've given us. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll end the webinar then. Uh, thanks again for your attention and attendance. Good night.